We are continuing on in our study of 2 Peter, but I'd actually like you to begin this morning by opening up your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Go ahead and find Psalm 2. It's the second one. What you're going to hear as we read this out this morning is the psalmist speak about the ultimate victory of Yahweh, God's ultimate victory and the ultimate victory of his anointed one. That is to say, his chosen one over all of their enemies. This is a psalm that's about God establishing his king over his people. It's a psalm about God's son that proclaims his authority over all nations in the world. That speaks about his authority to carry out final judgment over the whole earth. And in the last section of this psalm, The writer wants all the kings of the earth to be warned. He warns them to be wise. He says, serve Yahweh with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Because the Son of God will destroy everyone who is set against him. But anyone who would kiss the Son, anyone who would love his Son, who would serve him, in him they will find refuge. That is safety, grace, mercy, and peace. Let's read this together. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath, and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. Yahweh said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Come here first this morning. Because Peter is going to remind us as we get into his letter once again. Scriptures like these are God-breathed prophetic words that confirm for us that the gospel of Jesus Christ has always been God's plan for salvation. They remind us, they remind us of something that will become so important to Peter as he writes out these words, that the whole body of Scripture, from Old Testament to New, the entire corpus of authoritative, inspired Scripture, directs us to the God-sent Messiah and the good news of his ultimate victory. All hope that we might have about that coming day of the Lord rests fully, completely, and finally in our faith in God's Son. That's what this psalm was about. And that's what Peter saying to us. First, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for giving us this word that is breathed out by you. Lord, to borrow the technical term that is inspired by you. Thank you, Lord, that you, you set men down to write these things 
that by the power of your spirit they were all perfectly remembered and perfectly communicated so that we would have this authoritative self-revelation of the God who we love. So that we would have this source that comes from you by which we can go and learn about God. We can grow in our knowledge of our Lord, of our Savior, of our King. Lord, your will, your heart, your plan is revealed to us here. So let us be humble enough that when we find it, we are taught by your word. Lord, let us be humble this morning as we open it up and study it. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. In your glorious name, dear Jesus, we beg for your help to study this word. Amen. All right, now we can open up to 2 Peter, and we're actually going to be picking it up at verse 12 this morning. I know that was kind of rolled into the message that we went through last week, but we only really got to briefly visit Peter's words here at what the end of what ended up being kind of a, a long message, <laughs> and there's still so much more for us in these verses that we didn't really get to talk about. So as we open it up to verse 12 here of 2 Peter chapter 1, what you need to remember is kind of where we are in the letter. Remember that Peter's primary concern so far can be summarized in one simple truth that he's been trying to communicate over and over and over again. That the gospel of Jesus Christ is enough. That the gospel is sufficient. If readers want to have great faith, if they want grace and peace, if they want to be sanctified, to go and live the holy life, Peter's been telling them over and again, just know and trust and believe in the gospel. Trust in the sufficiency of the gospel. God, by his divine power and in his divine mercy, has given you everything that you need to have this vibrant and powerful and an effective and meaningful spiritual life that you want. That's been Peter's message so far. Just reminding these people that God has forgiven their sins, that God has already rescued them from slavery and death and corruption. So now go and bear fruit. Go and live lives of virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection. And that agape, self-giving, self-sacrificial love. The kind of love that God is. All of that is what Peter is reminding them of, as he says here in verse 12. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. What we see here is Peter really doing the job of a pastor. This is, this is Peter the pastor right here, which is really fitting as he sees himself as one among fellow elders. Remember, we saw that back in 1 Peter chapter 5. He said, I exhort you as a fellow elder to shepherd the flock of God. And that's what he's doing here. He's shepherding these Christians. He is fulfilling the ministry that Jesus gave to him years before. When you go into Luke's gospel, and there's that moment where Peter is swearing up and down that even if everyone else falls away, Jesus, I will never abandon you. And of course, Jesus reveals to him that, well, yes, Peter, you will. In fact, your fall will be more dramatic than theirs because you won't deny me just once, you'll deny me three times. But he, he also told him that that would not be the end. That would not be the end of his ministry. He, he told Peter in Luke chapter 22 at verse 32, he would have a ministry after that. He says, Peter, you're going to fall away. But once you turn again, once you turn and come back, I want you to go and strengthen your brothers. And that's the ministry he's fulfilling here. The great task 
of any of us who have been called to shepherd the flock of God, which includes me, includes the other five elders here at Rockridge, includes the elders of every other church in the global capital C church. The great task of any of us who have been called to this ministry to shepherd the flock of God is to do precisely what Peter's doing here. To remind you. To remind you of the power and the glory and the grace and the mercy of God that is revealed to you and imparted to you through the completed work of Jesus Christ. Through the gospel. Our task is to, according to the best of the gifts that God has given us, teach you the gospel. And then spend a lifetime in discipleship, preaching that gospel over over and over and over again to you, counseling you with that gospel, calling you back to that gospel as many times as you need. Pastors, elders, are not installed in the church because the church needs really exciting thought leaders or because the church needs influencers or because the church needs philosophers. We are installed in these offices because the flock of God will always have an urgent and ongoing need to hear the gospel of Christ So when I think about what my role is here in the family, I am not here to rock your world and blow your mind with my ideas, with what I think about anything. If you want to know what I think about stuff, you can call me at any time, but from this pulpit, that is never my job. I am here to deliver to you that which has been entrusted to me, the thing of first importance, that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that he rose from the grave three days later, that he now sits at the right hand of the Father with all things under his feet and in his authority, and that at the time of his choosing, he will return. And you will hold this world in final and ultimate judgment. I am in full agreement with the great preacher and Bible commentator Martin Lloyd-Jones, who wrote, The business of the church and of preaching is not to present us with new and interesting ideas. It is rather to go on reminding us of certain fundamental and eternal truths. Let us never get it into our heads as the people of God, as the people of Christ, that we have simply heard enough of the gospel. Let us never be found thinking that we've been coming to church long enough, that we've served faithfully enough, we've been to enough Bible studies, we've been part of enough life groups, we've sung enough songs, we've been to enough conferences that we no longer need these reminders. That we no longer need to be told about the gospel of Christ. That we no longer need these foundational and fundamental things of God. It's very telling that Peter knows his readers have heard all this before. Whether it was from him or whether it was preached to them by Paul, he knows that they know the gospel, that it was given to them accurately and truthfully, and that by God's grace they received it and they believed it and they accepted it. Peter says as much, I know that you know this. I know you are established in the truth. You are strong in it. But he says, I'm writing to remind you anyways. Because no matter how established you might be, you still need it. He's calling them back to the basics. 
back to what God has already done. And that's particularly important because of the situation that he knows these churches are in. He knows that there are false teachers out there who have infiltrated the assembly. False teachers have come along and they've smuggled in bad ideas about the gospel, bad ideas about Christ. And as sad as it is, they seem to be finding an audience in these churches. They seem to be having success we might consider ourselves to be established in the truth. A gospel-proclaiming, Bible-preaching church, and man, we've been coming here for so long, we are strongly established in the truth of God. We have a Christian resume that's a mile long. We can point to a lifetime of church attendance, a lifetime of submitting to others, being discipled, and, and hearing and reading and believing all the right things but we are still human. We're filled with the Spirit of God, in union with the Spirit of God, but there's still this flesh nature to contend with. And that means, no matter how many years we might consider ourselves to be established in the truth, sound and strong and steady in the faith, we're always vulnerable. We're always vulnerable to sin. We're always vulnerable to error in our doctrine and our belief. We're even vulnerable to be tempted away from the gospel that we started with. From the pure spiritual milk, the simple gospel message that was first preached to us. And there are always bad teachers who are going to want to be the tempted. There will always be bad teachers who will want to come into the family of God's people and fill people's heads with another message. With bad theology, bad doctrine, leading to bad ethics, wrong ideas about God, wrong ideas about how we should live in light of what we know about God. Peter knew when he wrote this letter that there were wolves at the gate of the pasture. So Peter did what a shepherd does. He went and fought the wolves with these words. He shepherded the flock of God by trying to protect them. He wrote to these believers, he says, for the purpose of moving them to action. Of being so truthful and direct with them that it would actually make them uncomfortable and make them think and reflect. He says, I'm writing to you to stir you up. Not by animating them with a bunch of new ideas and stuff they haven't heard before. Not by trying to inspire them to live in a bunch of new ways. He writes to stir them up, he says, by way of reminder. He strengthens his brothers and sisters, not by giving them new things, but by emphasizing the old things. Things that they've already heard, but that they need to hear again. The gospel of Jesus Christ. We are part of the church. The church is the people of God. And the people of God, from the time of Moses until today, have always and will always struggle against false teachers and bad ideas. Heresy until Jesus returns will always be a problem for God's people. So the church will always need its elders to shepherd the flock of God this way, by calling you back to know the things that you already know, by preaching to you the truth, no matter how firmly established in it you might think yourself to be, so that you too might be stirred up moved to reflection, moved to action, and strengthened to recognize and resist the false teachers and the bad ideas that belong to the spirit of our age that we live in. Now, here's a challenging word. I've put the onus of all that on the elders, the shepherds. 
But the biblical truth is that this is not just the job of the shepherds over the flock. This is also the job of the flock to each other. The members of the body owe this service of reminder to each other. You owe this to each other. We have this command from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. See if you can find a familiar word here. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. So you know that the word calls you guys to stir up your brothers and sisters, the same way that Peter is stirring up his readers here. In his inspired wisdom, Peter has, I think, shown us how we can stir each other up as the scriptures command. Don't depend only on the elders to do this. Preach the gospel to each other. Call each other back to remember the foundational things of the gospel of Christ so that we will all be constantly reminded and none of us might forget that in Christ's completed work, our sins have been forgiven. and We've been given new life. Remind each other constantly of the basic things, the bedrock things in which all of our hope is invested. The atoning death of Jesus Christ that gives us forgiveness of sins. His resurrection that gives us the promise of our resurrection. His return. The final judgment that leads us into eternal life in paradise with God. I'll do my best to stir you up to remember those things, but you guys stir each other up to remember and believe these things. And then to go and live lives that confirm that you believe them. Now, Peter has a word here that I think may give us a, a special point of emphasis for our brothers and sisters who are, well, shall we just say, a little bit more advanced in age. Notice what he says in verse 13. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. So Peter, as he writes this letter, knows that he is close to moving on from this world. What he has written here tells us that part of his very motivation for writing this second letter is that he knows he's going to die soon. It's because he knows he doesn't have a ton of time left in this world that Peter feels the need to remind these churches of the gospel and to stir them up to believe in it and hold fast to it. That's a pattern. That's a pattern of life. And, and I challenge this body, myself included, to follow the pattern that Peter has given us here. With the little time that he had left, knowing that he had little time left. The thing that Peter considered to be such a high priority was to exhort others to stand strong in the gospel. So he preached it. And he called people to remember it and believe in it. He knew he was going to die, and so it added urgency for him to fulfill his ministry as a shepherd of the flock of God. And the question for us to ask ourselves this morning is, will we have the same attitude as our time in this world draws to a close? When we're living in our golden years, what are we going to be concerned with? What's going to be on our list of high priorities? Is it going to be planning cruises? Is it going to be whacking golf balls? Or is it going to be knowing that we are about to put off this body and depart this world, urgently fulfilling our ministry 
and compelling others, exhorting others in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to rip off this whole bit, but I strongly encourage you guys, because I know you probably have YouTube on your phones, it's pretty easily accessible. Uh, go ahead and open it up sometime today and just punch in the words, John Piper, don't waste your life. It's the most powerful sermon about this idea that I've ever heard. What will be the things of first importance to you as you get into the third act of your three-act play here in this world? Peter's expectation of his passing motivated him to make every effort, as he wrote in verse 15. He said, I know I'm going to die soon, so I am making every effort so that after I leave here, the church will not lose the gospel as he preached it. Now for Peter, that meant writing this letter. It probably meant writing his first letter. But you know, it also included making sure that he sat down with John Mark and narrating everything he could about his time with Jesus. That's how we get the gospel according to Mark. So that's what it meant for Peter to make every effort. And considering he's an old man in prison under the tyranny of the Roman government, I'd say that's quite an accomplishment. Two epistles and a gospel that remain foundational to the scriptures to this day. That's what it looked like for him. What would it look like for you? What would it look like if instead of making every effort to just have a nice, quiet, comfortable retirement, we made every effort to fulfill our ministry, to build others up in the gospel so that it would never be lost and it wouldn't be forgotten before we put off this body. What can, what would you do to make sure that the church stands fast in the gospel of Christ before you go? I want you to receive that this morning as an encouragement, as a challenge, as an exhortation to follow Peter and make every effort to find out what that looks like, to find out what you can do. Because we need you. The church needs you. We need your ministry. We need your wisdom. We need your testimonies. We need your reminders. And praise God that even though every generation of Christians is and will be threatened by false teachers, all we have to do to go and do combat with those false teachers is just to remind each other of what we already know. To remind each other of the gospel truth. If we stand in the gospel, we stand in the word of truth. We don't have to keep pace with false teachers. We don't have to put on a better show than they do. We don't have to try to wow people by coming up with new revelations to, to match theirs. That certainly isn't what Peter does here. Because he knows, and we need to know, that the gospel is enough. The gospel is enough to fight heretics with. The gospel is enough to shepherd the flock with. It's enough to strengthen our brothers and sisters. The gospel is enough because the gospel is true. And that's Peter's message as he moves on from verse 15 to verse 16. So he's going to do everything that he can to remind people of the gospel because no matter what those false teachers say, that message of Jesus crucified, resurrected, ascended, and sitting at the right hand of the Father waiting to return is not some made-up sequence of stories. Unlike what the false teachers have to offer, it's not some invented idea. We'll get into verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths 
when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And when I have talked about the gospel with people who don't believe in the gospel, well, the word proves itself true that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those of us who believe it is the power of God. I've been told that I believe in fairy tales. I've been accused of believing in stories that were invented to control people. If you know the history of the church, those stories have never done a very good job of controlling people. I have been ridiculed as a fool who believes in an invisible sky wizard or sky daddy. And I have been told that my Bible is actually a book that was written to keep people in slavery to keep people under control. Some people have borrowed Karl Marx's old line and said that I smoke the opium of the masses. Those people have never even tasted the power of the gospel, I can tell you that much. The gospel is not a fairy tale. It's not a bunch of made-up stories. Peter reminds us that the gospel that he and the other apostles preached is grounded in real historical events. Everything they've reported is something that really happened. It is something they really saw. It's something they really heard. You might remember that when Peter and John, in the book of Acts, as the church is exploding in Jerusalem, they are threatened with arrest and beating by the temple officials if they keep preaching the gospel. And they didn't say, okay, yeah, hey, we're sorry, you know, we were telling these stories because we really need people to believe us because we're trying to grow this organization and, and well, we just need people to buy into the legend. We need people to believe the myth. No, what they said was that they had to, they had to speak so boldly because they knew they were speaking the truth. This is from Acts 4.19, but Peter and John answered them, whether is whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to listen to God, you must judge. For we cannot speak, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. When the Apostle John sat down to write about Christ, he didn't begin his letter of 1 John by saying, Come and hear the stories, come and hear the great fables that we've come up with. He wrote in 1 John chapter 1 that this letter was about. Jesus, who was from the beginning, who we heard, who we saw with our own eyes, who we looked at, who we even touched with our own hands. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, is what John wrote. When Paul wrote about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, he clearly doesn't think that he's writing about a myth or just an idea. He says definitively, Jesus really appeared in resurrected form, first to the twelve, then to James and some other apostles, even to as many as 500 people. And as if to say, you know, if you don't believe me, go ask them. He says, you know, some of those 500 people are still alive. The Christian faith has always been grounded in its historical reality. Your Bible is not a collection of stories about stuff that happened in Middle Earth. The Gospel is not a story about a bunch of invisible, untouchable gods who live on top of Mount Olympus. The Gospels are eyewitness accounts that proclaim the very real Messiah, the incarnate Word, the Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus. The false teachers who Peter is doing combat with through this letter were probably saying a lot of the same kinds of things that I remarked earlier have been said to me. And probably they've been said to you if you've been bold enough to talk about the gospel with non-believers too. They denied that Jesus was actually coming back. That's pretty clear as you get to chapter 3, verse 4. and. And they're saying things like, well, where's the promise of his coming? 
They were probably saying things to these churches like, oh, come on, you really think Jesus is sitting in heaven right now? You really believe that? Look around you. Do you really think he has authority over everything? Does it look like Jesus is in control? You really think he's going to come back and judge the world and hold people accountable to things that they've done and said? Doesn't that sound like something the apostles would just come up with to keep you in line? And if they were saying things like that, then this is Peter's response to them. He simply reminds them that the church that the gospel had preached to them is real. Or sorry, the gospel that the church had preached to them is real. It isn't a bunch of myths. The good news that Jesus has all authority that he has right now present power to equip his people for holy living, that he, yes, will return someday to welcome us into a glorious and unfading future after holding the world in judgment. There's not a single word of that message that is embellished or man-made. It's not a fable. It's not a legend. It's not an old wives' tale. It's the truth. It's as real as anything else we experience in this world. It's as real as the sun rising and setting. Peter reminds them, these are not myths. These are the things that we saw and the things that we heard. And then he declares that what the apostles saw and what they heard was not just the wisdom of Jesus, as if he's just a great sage who had a lot of interesting things to say. It wasn't even just his authority. It wasn't even just his divinity. Peter's convinced that Jesus will return because what he saw and heard was the majesty of Christ. Peter's convinced that Jesus is king because in this one beautiful moment in his time, Walking with the Messiah, he actually got to see Jesus as king. He got to see Jesus in the fullness of his royal power and glory. And that's what Peter remembers as he moves on to verse 17. He takes the church back to the transfiguration of Christ, which is remembered and recorded for us in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 17, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, and the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. He remembers the moment when Jesus and the twelve, they were all on their way to Jerusalem for their their ultimate journey to Jerusalem. And and Jesus had been telling them, you know, guys, uh, when we get to the city, I'm going to be handed over and I'm going to be abused and humiliated and killed, but I'm also going to rise from death. And of course, the apostles have no idea what he means. And according to Mark, they're even like kind of too afraid to ask him because they don't understand. But there's this moment where they stop on that journey. And Jesus takes Peter and James and John. and He takes them up onto a mountain to pray. And what Peter calls here in verse 17, the majestic glory, which is the cloud of God's presence that engulfed Moses even on the mountaintop all the way back in Exodus chapter 16. That same cloud of God's presence, the majestic glory came over them. And then they looked up and they saw Moses. And they saw Elijah. They saw the icon of the law and one of the prophets. But even more remarkably, they saw Jesus. But it wasn't Jesus as they had known him. They saw Jesus with all of the humiliation of his incarnation stripped away. They were eyewitnesses to this moment when Jesus received glory and honor from the Father. And they saw him with his appearance changed. He was so bright and so powerful, so radiant, that Luke says it was like he was dazzling light. They said it was like his his robes, his clothing was so pure white that You couldn't make it this white on earth. You couldn't bleach it to be this white. 
Jesus was radiant in his glory. It was unlike anything they had ever seen before. And then they heard the voice of the Father. They heard the voice from the majestic glory, just like Moses did. They heard the Father say, this is my beloved Son, my chosen one, with whom I am well pleased. And then, of course, the necessary addendum, listen to him. As Peter writes here in verse 18, it says, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. That one event has Peter absolutely convinced in the truth of Jesus' power and authority and return. If you were to ask Peter back then, how do you know Jesus is coming back? He would have held up the transfiguration as his absolute dead-on proof that the story of the second coming of Christ is not a myth. It is the truth. Peter's belief in Jesus' return and authority and, and kingship is rooted in what he saw and heard. He remembers the transfiguration because what he and James and John saw that day was a glimpse of Jesus as he will be when he returns. If you've ever wondered, what is it that they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration? That's it. It is Jesus as the Son of Man, as he will be when he comes on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's how Jesus describes it in Matthew chapter 24, at verse 30. The apostles saw Jesus on that mountain as he will be on the last day. As he will be when he comes in riding on a white horse. When he's called faithful and true. And he leads all the armies of heaven behind him. They saw Jesus as the psalmist wrote about him in what we started off with this morning. Jesus as he will be when he is finally ready to rule over the nations with a rod of iron. To bring ultimate judgment and final destruction upon his enemies and ultimate refuge to his people. They saw Jesus fully in his majesty. So here's Peter's challenge to the church, to his readers. It's essentially saying, I know these false teachers have come along. And they've got all these really neat ideas, and they're, they're really attracting you guys to come and follow them. And they're telling you that Jesus won't return, that we made that up. Well, you can go and believe those guys who have told you that Jesus isn't coming back. You can go and believe these guys who say that, well, because people are still born and live and die, just like they always have from the time of our fathers and grandfathers, well, that must mean that the resurrection must not be real. Well, that must mean that, that since Jesus hasn't already returned, he won't return in the future, and we just made the whole thing up. So now everything is permitted. You can go and believe them. You can go and believe those ideas, or... You can believe the gospel as it was preached to you. You can listen to me. You can listen to me, Peter, because I was actually with Jesus. And you can believe that Jesus is coming back because I saw and heard God speak that day. Because Jesus showed us the fullness of his royal power and glory. His majesty is the confirmation of our hope in his return. We have seen the Son of Man as he will be on the last day. So you can believe them or you can believe us. And for anyone still on the fence about that, Peter offers up one huge reason why they ought to side with the apostles and believe in the gospel. As Peter says, you know, the authority of what he's seen doesn't just hang on his own testimony about it. It hangs on the scriptures. Peter holds up the scriptures as the ultimate source of authority. And he says that what he's testified about is trustworthy only because it's authenticated in the word of God and what God has already said. 
that they should believe him because everything that he saw and heard is rooted not just in his experience, but in what he calls the prophetic word. That's what Jesus is saying, or Peter is saying at verse 19. If you don't believe me, then believe the scriptures. If you don't trust me simply because I'm an apostle, well then trust me because what I preach to you is the fulfillment of what the prophets who were inspired by God said so many generations ago. That's what he means when he writes, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. And that is something that his opponents, the false teachers, absolutely could not say. Because if you went into the scriptures, which by that time, the scriptures were the Old Testament. If you went and read the scriptures, you absolutely would not find the picture of God that they were presenting. You would not find this version of God who's just sort of okay with sin and injustice and is simply content to let the world continue on in corruption forever and who's never going to return and hold anyone accountable to their transgressions, and he's never going to pass judgment over the world. You cannot find that God in the Scriptures. Instead, the prophets spoke about this God who would bring the great and terrible day of the Lord, which was going to be great and terrible because it was the day he would bring his judgment upon the world. You find in the prophets this picture of God as one who ends all war and all conflict by bringing desolation upon the earth. Come and behold the work of Yahweh, how he has brought desolation. You get this vision of God as the one who breaks the bows and burns the chariots of his enemies. You see God as one who destroys all who were against him and his people. But for his people, he is refuge. For his people, he is peace and grace and mercy. And when he comes in judgment, he comes and restores his people. And he brings perfect justice and perfect judgment and perfect righteousness into the world. That's the God of the Scriptures. And we know that word is perfectly true because as Peter writes in verse 20, we know first and foremost, he says, that the scriptures are not written by the will of man. The scriptures are inspired by God. As he says, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The source of true biblical prophecy is not actually the prophet. It is the Spirit of God at work in those men. They are sails that catch the wind and are carried along. Isaiah didn't write his powerful and beautiful prophetic utterances because he woke up one day, looked at Judea, and was just so dissatisfied with all the injustice and with all the sin and corruption that he found. He wrote them because God had a message to deliver to his people, and Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Peter is saying that the gospel is trustworthy and true, not just because he said it is, but because God already spoke, and in the words that God spoke, you find the gospel. The gospel is true because it is affirmed in his inspired word. The men who spoke those words didn't speak for themselves. They spoke directly from God. And Peter's saying what they spoke about was Christ. What they spoke about was this gospel. And you know, this actually wasn't a new idea. When when Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the word of God is inspired, that was not a radical new idea. If you were a Jewish person at the time who had been raised in the scriptures, who had the law, who had the prophets, you already understood the scriptures to be the inspired word of God. You had already read Isaiah himself say, I am filled with the spirit of God. The spirit of God is upon me. So these people knew that the scriptures were from God. They knew that the prophets spoke God's message. And they knew that what the prophets revealed 
were things like God's suffering servant. This God sent savior and restorer of his people. This new covenant that God would make. This king and judge who would come and rule with all authority. It's on the basis of those prophetic words that Peter says here, the Gospels can be absolutely believed. Because all those visions, all those words, all those dramatic letters, they point to Jesus. The same Jesus who Peter has seen and heard. When Jesus himself is speaking to a bunch of Pharisees, he told them, that these scriptures reveal him. You might remember John 5.39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. When Jesus appeared on that road to Emmaus and was talking to a couple of the disciples, what did he do? He sat them down with the scriptures and showed them, beginning with the law and then going into the prophets how those Old Testament scriptures revealed the gospel. It's from Luke chapter 24 at verse 27. As Peter puts it here, the word is a shining lamp. It's a shining lamp given to us by the mouth of God to guide us while we live in a dark place. The word shows us the true light the morning star, who is Jesus. The star that's bright enough to to light up even the darkest and most desolate places. The gospel is enough because the word of God is enough. The word is enough to defeat heresies. The word is enough to stand strong because it is the highest and most absolute truth spoken by none less than God himself. So when we remind each other of the gospel, when we preach to each other about these things that we're already established in, when we preach Christ crucified and resurrected and ascended and and ruling and returning to each other, We are reminding each other of the most true things in this universe. When we just preach Christ crucified, when we preach the gospel, we're never shorting anybody anything. We don't owe them great shows. We don't owe them entertainment. We don't owe them new ideas. We owe people the truth. We owe people this gospel. We owe people the word. If we know that we live in a dark place, why would we be eager to give someone anything except this shining lamp that can guide them? The things we already know, the things that have already been done, the things that have already been spoken, they are our best defense against false teachers and new heresies. They are our best guide through this world. So if you can apply that, I just want you to remember that if and when someone comes to you claiming to have this great new idea about God, or that they've discovered the secret to unlocking the prophecies, unlocking the gospel, accessing your anointing, whatever other silly phrases they invent, when that person comes and finds you, Remember that you have a word, an absolutely true prophetic word that you can examine them against. You have the gospel that you can check bad ideas against. The completed work of Christ is something you already know. So when bad ideas come along to confuse you and make you unstable, stand fast in them. Be reminded of it. Be reminded of this gospel that the entire word of God reveals. So as 
the worship team rejoins us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the time you've given us to be together today. Lord, thank you for what Peter has written here about your word, about your gospel. Lord, help us Help us to constantly remind each other of this gospel. Lord, help us to stand fast in it, always. Lord, don't let us succumb to the attractiveness of new ideas. Don't let us be tricked when bad ideas about you are smuggled in under the veil of truth. Lord, let us be people of your word, of your prophetic, inspired word. Let us be people of your gospel, so constantly connected to it, so, so deeply in love with it, that we will not fail to stand fast in it when we need to. Thank you, Lord, for the word of the cross, though it may be folly to others. Let us always remember that it is your very power for the salvation of our souls. In your glorious name, dear Jesus, we pray. Amen. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. It opens prison doors, sets the captive free. And I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well. Within my soul, spring up, oh well, make me whole. Spring up, oh well, give to me that life abundant.
within my soul spring up away make me whole spring up away and give to me that life abundantly I've got a river of life flowing now of me makes the lame to walk and the blind to see and opens prison door sets the captives free and i've got a river of life flowing out